Good morning, Dr. Terrell. Good morning. Let me get started here. There we go. You know. Uh, Dr. Terrell, I had a real quick question. Uh, yeah, hold on just one sec. You got it. My uh, audio set up here. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Oh, wonderful, as I can hear you. I can hear you better than I normally can. Hopefully, oh, okay. the, hopefully the same goes for y'all. <laughs> we can hear really well. Oh, good, good. So, um, was there a question out there maybe? Yeah, I had a question. Okie doke. Um, what lab rotations are this week? Let me see here. I can answer that. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, that's weird. I think it probably should be the group twos because we were the ones who were going to be in lab before spring break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see here, let's see here. Now, this is 6 April, right? That is so weird. Oh, I see, I see, I see. I got it, I got it. Yeah, this is pretty darn confusing, but today we're expecting Rohini uh, Sharma, Estrejo, and Vu San, or San Vu, rather. And then tomorrow it's Cynthia, uh, et cetera. So it's all on, okay, let me share my screen here. Maybe uh, maybe that will help. Uh, duh. Let's see here. So this is the lab rotations uh, that I updated. And basically there's all this historical stuff, but this is where we are right now, you know. There's just three people coming in today. And then tomorrow, uh, that's the Wednesday group, that's going to be seven. That's going to be these five. And then Thursday is going to be these five folks. Does that make sense, Dylan? I think it was Dylan who asked that was. Yep, it does. Thank you. Excellent. 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 Okay. Okay. <sighs> okay. I cannot believe how badly Windows screwed up the file system when they decided to make it real proprietary with their with their OneDrive. And now it's like it's like this 
Easter egg hunt every time you need to open a file. Dr. T, okay. were you able to get your second dose? I sure was. I am fully vaccinated. Yay. Okay. Yeah, thank you for asking. That's sweet. Yeah. So if I bite anybody, you know, you're going to be okay. Were you afraid I was going to bite you? No. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but. <laughs> oh, really? And Corona's not transmitted through biting? I mean, I think even if you have the vaccine, you're still able to transmit the virus. Ah. Uh, yes, technicalities. Please biting people. Please don't bite people, Dr. T. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I won't bite. <laughs> okay. I'm almost there. Let me see here. Um, pad. I'm operating pretty slowly. I'm on, I'm on spring break Thorazine. Ah, there we go. There we go. Okie dokie. So let me do a new share. If I can find out how to do that. Ah, oh, there we go. New share. Uh, this is going to be, ah, here we go. Okay. So I still haven't figured out how to, how to make, um, zoom and PowerPoint and everything play together properly. So I'm just going to sort of minimize the menu here. And, oh, okay. I didn't quite mean to do that. Come on, dude. There we go. Hey, why did you come back? How about that? Okay, I'll settle with that. But um, uh, there's a little uh, bit of a to do about spectrophotometry here. We're, we're just going to stay with that for another couple weeks. Then we're going to move rather quickly through some other techniques and chromatography and mass spectrometry, basically. But um, uh, we're going to do a good job with spectrophotometers. So it might seem a little slow for a couple weeks, but so it is. So um, there's something that I like about this unit, which is, oops. which is that it's um, a, uh, there's a technology component. And I like to talk about technology. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, lasers and, uh, and similar uh, light sources. Uh, we'll talk about monochromators, which um, are the devices sort of like the heart of the spectrometer that separates light by wavelength. Uh, talk about detectors, um, optical sensors, um, which are sort of detector plus um, sampling methodology together. Talk a little bit about FTIR and talk about noise. And it's a real dance to touch on this in a meaningful way, but not get stuck in it. So um, I'm going to do my best here. Um, 
Now, uh, let's start with a discussion of a, a completely irrelevant but illustrative method, okay? And it's called cavity ring down spectroscopy. I don't think we're, there's gonna be any questions on this, but this involves some of the, um, uh, the methods that we uh, need to uh, invoke when we do um, absorbent spectroscopy. Um, and you know, if you can just look at Beer's law, for example, you can see that um, you know epsilon is a molecular quality. You know, C is typically an unknown, and B here is something that you can control uh, experimentally, right? It's the path length of your device, right? And it just so happens that um, you can increase B using some very clever methods. And um, uh, one is to use a, a set of mirrors that will uh, propagate a light pulse through a cavity um, and give it, say, a kilometer or two of effective path length. So um, that might look a little bit like this. So here in this case, in this diagram, off on the right, whoops, oh, geez. We have a diagram of a cavity ring down spectrometer. And in this case, there's a, there's a, they talk about a diode laser, but it's, it's really just a pulsed laser, right? And you can, you can pulse diodes in the nanoseconds. It's really a pretty cool quality. Uh, but if you, you know, it's um, anybody with a computer has a source of nanosecond pulses, right? Because your computer operates in the gigahertz. And so you can, uh, you can pulse a laser diode with a five volt, uh, one nanosecond long uh, excitation, right? And then that pulse can be directed into, this is, this, is, um, uh, this is an interesting sort of cavity here, right? But there's a, um, there's a beam splitter here and here, and there's a mirror here, right? And there's obviously, gonna, there's gonna be some loss here. And then there'll be um, some loss here, but that, well, it's not really a loss. This is where the detection happens. So I misspoke there. But so there's a little bit of loss here, but the, the amount of uh, beam that gets into the cavity, then um, it's split at this surface again, but it circulates it comes down and then there's a slight loss and then the rest of the pulse circulates, comes up, comes down, there's a slight loss, right? And what happens is that if you design these beers, beam splitters, et cetera, properly, then you can uh, create for this nanosecond pulse, you can create uh, an effectively a few kilometers of uh, uh, effective beam path length in this cavity, right? And then finally, what happens is the beam escapes and hits a detector. And for your pulse input, what you get is a is a decaying output. So um, you can see that the right after the light pulse goes in. Uh, this is on the microsecond time scale, right? So uh, this is a thousand passes uh, um, roughly through this um, one foot or so of path length here. So within about a thousand passes, the, uh, you've decayed down to about a tenth of the original pulse size, right? And there's simply a difference in the temporal part of the pulse decay when you have an absorber in this cavity. So 
this isn't a way to measure concentration without um, measuring, without relying on intensity, except in its, in, except in the temporal part of its decay, right? So this, this is actually the result of a single input pulse, which is stretched by circulation through this cavity and then detection externally here. And when you introduce an absorber into this cavity, it decays more quickly, right? So this is pulse number one. If you needed to average pulses, you might shoot in another pulse and that pulse could have a peak up here, right? But that's not gonna go into the analysis. What will go into the analysis is the decay qualities of that peak. It's the decay time in some sort of a stretched exponential decay that you're gonna measure. And it will be that decay time, which is diagnostic of the amount of analyte in the cavity ring down system. And just to sort of prove that it works, not that there's really any question about that, but um, uh, you can uh, use a, uh, some sort of a um, tunable laser diode that operates in the infrared here. And uh, this is the first overtone of the um, carbon oxygen stretch, I believe, for CO2. And you can use it to iso determine the isotopic breakdown of carbon-13 and carbon-12 um, CO2 in air, even though that's fairly, it's a fairly weak effect, right? And um, uh, so um, why would carbon-13 and carbon-12 give different um, vibrational frequencies. Different number of neutrons? Yeah, yeah, different number of neutrons. Uh, that, 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 that's why they have different mass. That's true. But why do they have different vibrational frequencies? And I sort of gave away the game there, didn't I? Because of different math. It's actually fairly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why do things with different mass have different vibrational frequencies? Because they have different mass, <laughs> right? <laughs> Does that make sense, Casey? Excellent, good. <laughs> Okay. How about you, Jean-Luc? Did that make sense? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, wow. You sound good. You sound good, Jean-Luc. <laughs> okay. So, um, now, um, Oh yeah, so you can you can actually use this to determine H by Lori in a uh, in breath, right? So you you um, you can uh, uh, feed somebody some C13 enriched urea, and then if they have H pylori in their stomach, creating CO2. Ugh, what an awful thought! But we all have it, you know. <laughs> um, then it's going to put out H. pylori, and you can you can um, uh, you know if you don't have an infection, supposedly this ratio remains constant at 0.1 percent. If you do, then it gets higher. But um, interesting, there's urea, right? It's 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 this diamino formaldehyde molecule. And it gets oxidized straight to CO2 by uh, bacteria. 
clever little beasties. Okay, so um, now back to more conventional territory. Um, this is the block diagram of a single beam spectrophotometer, right? There's a light source, a wavelength selector, a sample, and a light detector. Um, and in this case, you measure P0 by placing, instead of a sample, a blank in the beam. So um, while technically this is, this is correct, right? That P0 is the beam intensity before it goes in. You actually um, have to account for reflections at the various surfaces and scattering within the sample uh, and possibly other sources of light loss that have not, that are not related to analyte. So P0 is actually measured over here with a blank in the beam, yeah? And then when you put your sample in, the light level goes down, obviously, and then um, that is how, uh, Uh, that is how you measure uh, light absorbance. So, so um, a double beam instrument um, uses a. As an example, it can you it may use a pair of choppers or it may use a pair of detectors. But um, in the case where it uses a pair of choppers, a chopper is simply a mechanical uh, device. And um, the, uh, the one used in this illustration is a rotating chopper. And um, it has, the chopper here has an open section and a mirrored section, right? And I don't know why they, I think they're almost uh, normally 50-50 here. And um, in such a way that um, at any given point in time, you spend half of the time with the two open sections such that you're interrogating the sample and you spend half of the time with the, with the beam being directed through the reference cuvette and then back to the detector, right? So, um, uh, and you know, obviously these uh, rotate, these beam choppers in this design have to be completely synchronous. They, they have to have a phase that's constant. And um, uh, so, one of the advantages of the double beam here is that if the if the source has flicker, if it has a type of noise that causes its intensity to go up and down, then that flicker is compensated each time the beam travels between the cubet and the reference. And that that's a type of detection called phase sensitive detection. And it uses AC electronics in the detector. And that works a little bit better, right? So um, uh, now when you use AC detection, you improve your signal to noise ratio in general, right? There's a little bit more complexity in the detection, but as you go to higher frequencies, you can improve your signal to noise ratio for a couple of reasons. One is that you can compensate for the low, very low frequency fluctuations of the light source. And two, you can narrow the bandwidth of your, of your signal measurement you can narrow the frequency space over which you make your measurement in such a way that you can measure only over a certain narrow band of frequencies 
filter everything else out, all the low and the high frequencies. And in so doing, you can get a much purer signal. It's very similar to the way that radio, uh, uh, radio and telephones work. Uh, I'm sorry, radio, not telephones. There's no more telephones. There's mobile phones, right? So the radio signals that come out of them are on a specific frequency, right? And you can you can use this little battery powered widget you hold in your hand to communicate with a tower that's a kilometer away. And what's happening in your little widget is it's glowing, right? It's putting out little pulses of light. And because the source and the detector are tuned to the same wavelength and the environment is very dark at that wavelength, then there's this, then there can be an exchange of signals there. And that principle is similar to the principle of phase sensitive detection that's illustrated here, where the frequency of this chopping is typically in the kilohertz. That frequency is fed into the detector here. So the detector says, okay, I don't care about anything that's changing at one hertz or 100 hertz or 10 kilohertz. I'm going to focus just on the signal that comes out at one, you know, at say 5.43 kilohertz, right? And by so doing, it um, it focuses only on the signal to noise ratio, uh, or only on the signals coming from the uh, from the sample and the reference, right? Okay, end of sermon there. But that's that's phase sensitive detection, and it's a brilliant way to improve your signal to noise. It's used all through technology, you know, um, all through. Um, uh, radio and uh, radar and um, LIDAR and all kinds of optical detection methods. So um, now uh, here's an example of a carry type uh, uh, detector. And this is a carry 300. I don't believe we have one of them here, but um, the carry uses um, two sources. There's a UV source and a visible source. And these can either be mixed or they can be uh, selected using a flipping mirror. And, um, uh, and then that beam that's generated by these lamps is focused and spatially filtered by an entrance slit, right? So this entrance, the optics here in the entrance slit take the most intense part of the beam or part of the lamp, right? The glowing ball in the, in the UV lamp or the, the filament in the tungsten lamp. And it just, and it focuses down on just one piece of that. And then that piece makes it through this entrance slit. Um, and then it's actually convergent and slightly divergent out here, then this mirror will collimate that beam in such a way that it fills a grating. And we'll talk more about this. Then the, then the diffracted beam off of the grating will be then recollected by another mirror and exit slit, and then sent to a, um, uh, sent to a chopper uh, set up such that it can uh, uh, measure both a reference and a sample um, uh, light intensity. Okay. And in this case, the uh, detector is a photomultiplier too, and we'll talk more about them briefly too. So, um, uh, I don't know what to say. Here's here's a here's a a recent um, thermal scientific evolution 350. It's double beam. 
So it provides compensation. I mean, excellent composition. Are you a carry advertisement? It just has compensation. <laughs> okay. So um, now light sources. Here's where we can do a little bit of calculation. Uh, heated objects glow, obviously. Um, most objects, um, you know, if you look out at the universe, it glows at four degrees Kelvin, which is awfully cold. <laughs> um, that's why the cosmic microwave back room won't heat your hot dog. It'll only heat it up to four degrees Kelvin, which is still pretty darn cold. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, so, uh, however, when things get around um, 3,000 or 5,000 even Kelvin, then you can start to see their visible glow, right? So at, at, at 1,000, things will be very red because really their emission is chopping off in the mid-visible, right? But they get brighter as you go into the uh, long, into the uh, shorter wavelengths, actually. And then um, around five 5,000 Kelvin, you have a, I don't know how you can have a filament that will withstand 5,000 Kelvin, but, but um, uh, I'm guessing that tungsten is probably around a 3,000 Kelvin uh, color temperature or temperature for the um, emission. And this is the radiation profile is called black body radiation. And black body uh, simply refers to the radiation emitted by everything, everything made of electrons and protons, you know, everything that has charges that can oscillate. When you heat it up, will tend to emit light, you know. Uh, and this is. Um, uh, uh, this is where, you know, basically the photon was discovered or sort of rediscovered here, right? Because uh, uh, Newton said that light is made of corpuscles. He had the corpuscular theory of light, right? But then Faraday and Maxwell, they just nailed it. They just nailed the electromagnetic description of light, right? And that was it. That's on a continuous wave basis. But then Planck and Einstein, right around the turn of the century, turn of the uh, 20th century, they they said it just doesn't work, you know, because for continuous um, uh, distribution of oscillator frequencies, this curve should keep going up but it turns down. And the reason that it turns down is that the, the, each photon has more and more energy as, it, as its frequency increases. So frequency is increasing to the left here. So ultra, you know, ultraviolet here in the green, the, the intensities are dropping off pretty fast. This is, this is 100 nanometers here. This is 200 nanometers here. This is sort of like the limit of a normal spectrophotometry. But so it went from corpuscles to waves back to corpuscles. But the new corpuscles are quantum waves, right? So they have a, a they are particles with a wavelength, you know? So I hate it when I say, you know, but no one knows, but they're particles with a wavelength. <laughs> And um, so the, the peak brightness in these curves is proportional to t to the fourth, which is pretty crazy here, right? And we can do some calculations with that on the, in, the, um, in the homework. Uh, but, um, you know, the sun is a black body radiator. It also has some... Um, also has some uh, hydrogen and helium emission, but the thing, the, the majority of the radiation is 
is continuous because in the in the in the interior of the sun most of the light is the photons are literally diffusing on their way out of this the sun and they take a thousand years for a photon to get from the center of the sun to the surface of the sun have you guys ever heard that that's crazy isn't it it's crazy it is. takes a thousand it just blows my mind. I was like, what? How is that possible? But the the you know, the same photon, it's it's scattered so many times. It's absorbed and re-emitted and scattered and everything. That the yeah, wavelength it's not going is in a straight line. Right, right. It <laughs> is not. It's not. It, it's a it's a compact, it's it's a very dense gas in there, yeah. So um, yeah, that's crazy. But um, I forgot what got me on that subject. But um, but yeah, just the sun is mainly black body radiation. It's a wonderful source too. It's like a point source. Um, so um, you know, this is about the simplest description of the greenhouse gas that I've ever heard but I don't really understand the greenhouse effect so well. So I'm gonna go with this one, right? That um, of all, you know, there's a whole bunch of radiation hitting both the, um, both the atmosphere and the earth, right? Um, but on balance, you know, the earth is also re-radiating some of that energy back out. And greenhouse gases absorb some of the re-radiated energy. And so um, that re-radiated energy is absorbed by two major components, which are water and CO2. And then there's some minor greenhouse gases like ozone, methane, chlorofluorocarbons, and I don't know if N2O is correct here. He might have meant NO2, but there's nitrogen oxides call it NOx, right? And um, so it, it's the re-radiated fraction that's absorbed by greenhouse ga gas gases that accounts for the warming of the earth as a function of the concentration of greenhouse gases. And I don't fully understand that statement, but I think it's about as close as um, uh, a sort of a, uh, an atmospheric layperson like myself can get. Um, so, um, uh, since 1750, we have increased the atmospheric CO2 from 280 to 410 parts per million through anthropogenic sources, right? That's the consensus that, you know, and there's there's a real, there's a lot of very careful science backing this up. I've seen a bunch of it, <laughs> you know, kind of unfakeable graphs. And they all show this, this really constant fluctuating background. And then around 1750 or so, it just starts to spike. You know, and that's when we started burning coal, you know. So um, two watts per square meter of additional heating. So that's an eight tenths of a degree C warmer now than it was in 1900. <laughs> but it's enough to change climate, you know. And unfortunately, Russia is super happy about it because they, they're always too cold up there. Those darn Russians. <laughs> oh, gosh. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so for spectroscopy, you need a continuum light source, right? You need something that's bright over all wavelengths. Uh, it's... Uh, intense and stable over time. And um, 
And so, uh, you know, uh, what typically is done is you match a deuterium emission and a tungsten, a tungsten emission lamp, right? Uh, well, tungsten, it's not called an emission lamp. Um, it's a, called a black body source, right? That type of emission is just generic for um, all uh, emitting bodies. And, um, uh, and you'll see here that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, a quartz tungsten halogen lamp, that's gonna peak around a thousand nanometers, right? So it's gonna, its peak intensity will be outside of the visible range, but that's okay, you know, because uh, there's actually a good, a good deal of light out to about 2000 nanometers. So if you wanna use that, if you have a detector that's sensitive to it, you have optics that work, then you can look at the near infrared. Although near infrared is fairly quiet spectrally. There's not, um, I mean, I'm gonna piss off so many people by saying this, but there's not a whole lot of things absorbing at, that, at those frequencies. Like even the body is fairly transparent at those wavelengths, you know. So you can you can look through tissue and whatnot at two thousand nanometers. But um, you know, obviously there's a lot of scattering, and you know, bones aren't transparent there. But um, I don't think anyway. <clears throat> but you can pair a a tungsten lamp with a deuterium lamp here, right? <clears throat> and the deuterium lamp. Um, I forget, that's probably gonna explain why here down below, but why we use deuterium and not hydrogen. But, um, you know, one may be to mix hydrogen and deuterium to scramble the emission wavelengths a little bit. And also to, um, uh, uh, there's, there's another reason that has to do with lamp longevity. And so by combining these, you can get uh, some intensity over the 200 to say 1100 nanometer range, right? And um, there's, uh, it's interesting here because the, the light source intensity is going up around 200, but the overall detectability is going down to zero. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that silica is beginning to absorb around 190 as is oxygen and nitrogen and other atmospheric components, right? So you can't go below or about 190 because of the absorption of air, you know? And then also the detectors are less sensitive and the optics are less reflective and there's all kinds of other reasons why the detectability of light goes down at that wavelength, you know? So you have, need something a little bit special to do those studies. And they would be they would be taught in Gen Chem if we had the type of spectrometer to do it, but we don't. So maybe your children will learn that. Now probably our children are not gonna learn that. Probably their children might learn that. <clears throat> so then uh, so a deuterium uh, arc lamp, I mean this is the this is the dissociation picture, right? that you just basically blast it with electrons. You can excite it and then it will dissociate and produce photons. And this particular photon uh, lies on a continuum because the kinetic energy of these two uh, nuclei lie on a continuum. So um, there you have it, you know. Um, and so the... Uh, the xenon arc lamp um, is an interesting, intense uh, light source. And I absolutely hate it because it's a status symbol. And it means that the guy blasting your eyeballs with those blue headlights behind you is driving a some expensive car and it's got xenon 
lamps and they're killing your eyeballs. So I, I'm going to start a class. We're over the xenon headlamp here. Yay, Roger. Uh, but but uh, they work well for spectroscopy. 175 to 1,000 couldn't be a better range, you know. But you know they're they're spiky. They're a spiky output. You have to be careful with them. So um, mercury. Mercury lamps, uh, you may or may not be aware, are their uh, fluorescent lights are mercury emission lamps, and they have they all have a little bit of mercury in them, and that mercury is vaporized in the in the tube. You know, it has about one microtor of vapor pressure, and then when you I guess when you start blasting with electrons, you can get more into the vapor phase. I'm not really sure. But you take this gas phase mercury vapor, you put it into a into a tube, and you you literally shoot electrons at it. You know, so you need a couple thousand volts. That's why they have step up transformers in them. And so you get sixty hertz, two thousand volts, and you're going yee, 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 yee. and so they're flashing at sixty hertz, and it drives some people absolutely bananas. And I don't know, but um, uh, but uh, uh, but but they emit only at certain lines, you know. So the light is very distressing for the human eye, unless you phosphor convert it into the visible, and it's the same thing that's done with LEDs. They have phosphors in them that convert the blue from the indium gallium arsenide into, or indium aluminum arsenide, sorry, into uh, into a broad spectrum over the over the over the white. So, in any case, uh, they are phosphor converted as are LEDs. Um, lasers are interesting light sources. Um, uh, they are monochromatic, generally. I mean, there are there are continuum wavelengths. They're called super continuum lasers, but I don't know how they work. Um, generally, lasers are monochromatic. They're extremely bright. So all of the power that they put out is packed into a very narrow band of wavelengths, right? They're very well collimated, which is why they're a short, a narrow beam of radiation. They're typically polarized, such that the electric field vector is in one plane as it leaves the uh, laser. And Importantly, also they're they're coherent, and what the coherent means is that the electric field vectors rise and fall in phase. And so, if you um, uh, if you ever get a chance to play with a laser pointer, you can say point it at the corner of the wall, and it will generally create a speckle pattern. And the speckle pattern is a three dimensional thing. And you can see it, um, and that's a function of the coherence of the of the laser source. But um, uh, come on, my mouse is messed up today. There it is. Um, Oh goodness. So um <clears throat> so laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And um uh you know um stimulated emission is the 
exact quantum inverse of absorption. And um, absorption is photon plus ground state makes upper state. Right? Now, it also happens that photon plus upper state can make ground state plus two photons, two photons. So Casey, what is absorption? It's photon plus ground state makes what? It goes up to an excited state. Exactly. Photon plus ground state makes upper state. Now, stimulated emission is photon plus upper state makes, Cindy? Ground. Oh. Ah, ground state plus. Unmute. OK, so if it goes down to the ground state, means it's going, you're going to lose whatever, the, I mean, the energy that kind of went in, but also you're, you're losing the energy that you needed to absorb in the first place. Right. You're giving off a photon. Right, right, right. So you can have upper state makes ground state plus photon. Right? Upper state makes ground state plus photon. Does that make sense? That conserves energy, right? But it also happens that you can take upper state plus photon makes ground state plus two photons. And you can say, well, what? Why do you need a, that happens anyways. Why do you need a photon? Right? It's just goofy. But when that happens, that's called stimulated emission. And that has a high probability of happening. If there's a traveling, if there's a photon of the same wavelength that matches the emission, it will stimulate that emission. The emission is stimulated by a photon, right? And the new photon that is created is coherent with the one that stimulated it. Does that make sense, Casey? It's um, how lightsabers, it's how lightsabers work. It is, I swear. So um, imagine, if you will, that, um, you have a ball and you're holding it up, right? You have a ball and you have two hands and you have a ball, right? And if the ball's in your lower hand, right? I've got to put these in, in scale here, right? In On camera, right? Then if someone knocks your lower hand, you can toss the, the ball up to your upper hand. Now you have a ball in your upper hand, right? And then what can happen there is that a ball can come down or a photon can come along like, and knock the upper hand and you drop the ball, it goes down. But then what happens is that creates two identical photons. And that phenomenon is called super radiance, super radiance. It happens only for the type of particle known as a boson. I used to thought that was, why did they name a particle after Bozo the Clown? But no, it was named after Satyendra Bose, who's an Indian physicist who, who discovered the statistics that, that underlie that. And um, uh, it was, and Bose and Einstein worked together on this because Satyendra tried to publish it and nobody would publish it. So he wrote to Einstein and said, hey dude, Come on, I figured out the statistics that, that underlie photons, you know? And, and Einstein listened to him, he said, yes, you have, that's brilliant, you know? And it was, it was partly because it was a mistake. He was lecturing and he made a mistake. 
and he got all tangled up in lecture. He was like, ah, what happened, you know? But he made this funny flip of symbols and, and he discovered how bosons work, right? And bosons, you know how fermions, they can't occupy the same space with all the same quantum numbers? It's like why electrons are, you know, you can't, can only have, you got to spin pair them and then they can fit in the same orbital. You can't just have a bunch of electrons. Well, bosons are different. Photons are bosons, right? As you know, there's all kinds of bosons, but photons are the most familiar one to us, right? And bosons like to have the same quantum state. So for a super radiant medium, if a photon comes through and stimulates a bunch of emission, then the photons that are created are all identical. They're in the same place at the same time with the same quantum numbers. And they break the rules in that way, right? They break the familiar rules of, of, uh, of matter, right? This form of energy likes to compactify. So that's one of the qualities of laser light, you know, is it's generated in a, in a super radiant medium. Now a super radiant medium is a medium wherein the, um, the upper states outnumber the lower states. So um, in a laser, for example, uh, this is a typical energy level diagram of a laser. This is a four state molecule, right? It's got zero, one, two, and three states. That's four total states, right? <clears throat> and the reason that this four state is more common for lasers is that if you've got a metastable state two, that is, it's, it's just an anomalously stable state, then that state can emit light And then the lower state that's associated with that emission can be very short-lived. It can just vanish, right? Such that this process, this absorption, the absorption from state one to state two, this upward transition is almost impossible because state two does not stick around. State two is an electronic configuration, right? And that configuration immediately decays away. Right? So it's so that by pumping energy into the system, you can accumulate state two such that its population is greater than state one. And when that's the case, that medium is super radiant at the frequency corresponding to E2 minus E1. That means that there's a population inversion between state two and state one. Ain't that weird? Sit on that for a while. It's, it's a pretty wild thing, right? So that means if you put light in with a frequency corresponding to E2 minus E1, right? More light will come out. If you put one photon in, you might get a thousand photons out. The same frequency, the same phase, the same direction, coherently. So the photons all crash out of solution. <laughs> kind of yeah 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 exactly we put it's one a, grain of sugar too many and it all right came out. right right and boom yeah exactly exactly right i love it i love it that's a good uh taryn sort of likes that i think she she put up a face that looked scared <laughs> 
<laughs> I just think it's like kind of an interesting concept to kind of think about it like KSP where it's like you just put one thing too many to override equilibrium and then it just like spits everything out again. Yeah. Yeah, that's in the that's a great a uh, great metaphor, yeah. And uh so the thing about so that that that's kind of suited to understanding pulsed lasers, you know? Because there's there's really two types of lasers, one where you continually put in energy and they'll continually maintain this population inversion and they will emit light at that one frequency. But then there's also, um, Tanya just disappeared. Oh, well. <laughs> I was talking to her. But, um, but then there's also pulse lasers where the population inversion grows and then there's a pulse of light and then it vanishes and it grows and there's a pulse and it vanishes, you know? Pulse lasers are also real important too. They're very, um, they're fairly, it's fairly common and, and um, I'm just gonna editorialize for just one second here, right? This is an important technological fact, which is that there's a type of pulse laser. It was discovered by accident. Somebody tweaked the mirror and their, their, their laser started pulsing, putting out this train of pulses. It was actually like in the megahertz, right? But it was, they were pulses, right? And so it was this intense packet of photons was just going back and forth, you know, getting shot out of this laser, right? And um, that, that was an even more extreme example of the way that light likes to bunch up, likes to get its, all its energy into one packet, you know? There's the coherence phenomenon of stimulated emission, but there's also this temporal coherence. And now it's possible in, you know, in many chemistry and physics laboratories to have a, a laser with a peak power that's greater than the entire world's power consumption at any given moment. We're talking terawatts and they only last a femtosecond or a hundred femtoseconds or something like that but it's just such incredible power and they have to they have to do these they, they have to chirp the pulses it's called in order so they don't destroy the optics right they expand the beam and they chirp the pulses but then when they put when they de-chirp them and focus them they will just obliterate whatever they hit. There's such an incredible concentration of energy that they will literally cause protons and, new and electrons to just fly in different directions. And whatever matter was there is just gone. It's called Coulomb explosion. And it is the coolest thing, because if you look at a pit after a Coulomb explosion, there's no heat, there's no diffusion at all. You can't even tell it was ever hot. There's just a piece of matter missing. There's just a hole, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> anyway, I digress way too far there. I'm sorry. Uh, but it, it's just such a wild thing. And, and I'd love to talk to somebody more about it if you ever want to talk to me in office hours or whatever. But anyway, so you have a super radiant medium and that, that will make a laser. Um, and also it helps to have a cavity, right? And typically there's a, a, a fully reflective mirror and then there's a partially transmitting mirror, you know? And, and laser light just leaks out uh, through the partially transmitting mirror, you know? And most of the energy is inside the laser, but the amount that leaks out is what we see as an actual laser beam. And um, 
Semiconductors make lovely lasers. You can pump them electrically, directly pump them electrically. Um, three hundred and eighty is really genuinely ultraviolet. You know. And these are these are the ones with the direct. These are direct gaps, you know. And then you can also double the frequencies of these. Um, and uh, you can do all kinds of different wavelengths in between by frequency doubling, which is another crazy cool thing that we don't have time to talk about. And I don't have I don't have expertise to talk about. Anybody had a pulse oximeter on their finger? You go to the hospital and they put this little thing on your finger and it tells you how much ox how oxygenated your blood is. Uh, well, there's two, there's basically two diodes. It's it's a they 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 you need a, a reference, right? And so you have an infrared diode. Then you have a red diode that measures the, um, its intensity is proportional to the oxygenated blood, right? Because oxygenated blood is red, so tr that's transmitted through. Then as the oxygenation goes down, that red diode will get less, and it will, less will transmit through there. Pretty cool. Chemical spectrophotometer on your finger. Okay, so um, let's talk about monochromators real quick and we'll, we'll talk about, we'll try to get through a couple of calculations here. But, um, you know, this is uh, the, uh, on the left here, the monochromator has a, an important function, right? It takes in light of many wavelengths and it puts out light of a single wavelength and then it can scan through different wavelengths. Now a polychromator will take out, take in light of many wavelengths and it will create a pattern, a spatial pattern of wavelengths, right? And that's like a, a it's like a camera and it'll create a rainbow. And those are also important. But, um, uh, there's, um, you know, this is this type of uh, arrangement of mirrors and grading is called the Cherney Turner arrangement. And it's by far the most common and most commercial instruments are a variation on this. <clears throat> and it's where you take um, a point source, you collimate it, you illuminate a grading with it, and then you refocus the output. And in, in this uh, design, the rainbow is going to appear along the focal plane here where the exit slit is. So that's an important idea, the focal plane of the, of the uh, uh, system, right? And here's, a, here's an example of a transmission grading, right? They've just got it pointing, the beam is pointing down so that it's it's hitting this surface, right? But, um, and they've probably enhanced the crap out of the colors, I don't know. But, but you can see here that the least diverted beams are in the, are in the ultraviolet and the most diverted beams are in the, are in the red, right? So, what we should be seeing is a pattern, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Uh, we can't see orange for some reason here, but, <clears throat> and you can see here, uh, basically two orders of diffraction. That there's, well, there's three. There's a zero order, which is not diffracted. There's the first order, and then this minus two order here, that's fairly clear. So you got red, green, blue, right? And then there's a third order here, but you can't really see it. But you notice they actually get more spread out as the order increases. 
And that's one way to do high resolution spectroscopy. But, um, but you know, this is how that works on a certain level. And um, basically, um, <clears throat> this, this is um, the operating principle of a grading, right? Uh, what we have, this is a transmission grading, right? And what's important about a transmission grading is that it has regularly spaced interruptions in the path of light, right? And it's that regularity here, this constant D value in the, in the, in the spacings of these scattering centers, right? There's um, that, that, make it possible to observe at a different angle, call this angle phi here, right? Such that if you observe light hitting a grating, if you observe it from an angle phi, you will see a wavelength lambda, which is equal to d sine of phi. That will be an intense wavelength that you're angle of observation, right? And so as lambda increases, phi increases, right? Sine of theta increases as theta goes up. So as lambda increases, phi increases. And, you know, if you have a, a set of incoming beams, you have another angle, um, call it theta, right? Then let n lambda will equal d sine theta plus sine phi, right? That's if it's coming in from, uh, you know, one direction and leaving at a different direction, you know? So um, that's called the grading equation. And it's, and you, you guys familiar with the idea of constructive? Oh, well, I, I completely left that out here. This is based on the idea of construction, constructive interference, right? Yeah. Have, are you guys, Casey, are you familiar with the idea of constructive interference? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Well, you know, it's basically just that like when, when, the, when, the, um, when the waves are in phase, then N lambda is equal to D sine theta, right? That condition is true, then there'll be a bright output. Then if it's N plus a half lambda equals D sine theta, that will correspond to a dark place for that wavelength. <clears throat> and so the um, if you have a grading with a bunch of lines, then there will only be one angle where a given wavelength is bright and it'll be dark everywhere else. So that is, uh, has to do with resolution, right? <clears throat> and here's another look at the Cherney Turner design. Developed at the University of Arizona, Tucson. They have a good, um, uh, they have a good school of astronomy there. They have a good uh, telescope and whatnot. And they use Cherney Turner. They developed a Cherney Turner monochromator there. So, um, blah, blah. I don't actually like this stupid diagram here. Um, and here you're just adding up the path length differences from the two angles. But this, this is, I'm not going to derive this here, but this is an important equation. N lambda equals D sine theta plus sine phi. And, um, uh, well, this is a stupid picture of a laser disc. Or a CD or whatever it is. So, um, uh, 
I'm going to try to get a, a share going on to my uh, uh, document camera. It might not work, and I might end up burning up all of my remaining seconds here, just trying to do this one stupid thing. But um, let me give it a try anyway. Oh, there we go. Can you guys see the document camera? Sort of, possibly. Excellent. Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> so, um, from monochromator here. There is um, the grading equation, which is uh, n lambda equals d sine i plus sine r. Where um, you've got the, oh, is it upside down and backwards and weirded out for you? Can you put the orientation? Yeah. Darn it. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't know how to fix that. Cause it's like right for me. And I don't know, like, uh, maybe if I do this, but then I can't reach the stupid thing. It's like all in the way. Well, I'll try to work, work around it here. Okay. <laughs> I, I just don't have the bandwidth to fix the damn thing right now. <laughs> we got zero time, but there's this one. There's, uh, there's the um, effective bandwidth and this is equal to W times D cos R over NF and then there's the resolution which is uh, lambda over delta lambda is equal to N, capital N, where N is the number of grooves. So um, these three equations are all you need to, to understand to get around the all of the aspects of a, um, of a monochromator. So uh, I, I am completely out of time and uh, I've fooled around enough, but uh, we got we got through, you know, 30 or so slides out of 100. So we should be done with the slides probably by next Thursday. So I'll, and I'll, uh, and I'm gonna do more of the problems I, I know I promised that for today. I just didn't get to it, so. Okay, kids. Thank you so much for putting up with me. And uh, I, 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 I hope we learned something. And I will see you all soon. Uh, Bye -bye. Professor? Yes. Professor? Um, I just yes. want to confirm that the pilot lab is due on Thursday, correct? When is the Crystal Violet Lab due? It's due. You, have it. It was you like put it in May. The end. <laughs> okay, Cindy, and then and then Solomon. Cindy, when is it due? Uh, last I checked on Canvas, you have it due May seventh, like near the end of the semester. May seventh. Oh, oh. And then, like okay. everything else is well, due well, the week after that. <laughs> Oh wow, gee, that sucks. How how what did you see, Solomon? I was gonna say the first week of May, so Cindy was right. I was just reconfirming. Oh okay, story. okay. Oh, okay. all right. Well, uh, I don't know how that slipped by, but 
Yes. Uh, for this uh, chapter, do we have 44 questions? We have two. Yeah, we got a ton of questions, but they're easy. They're all easy. They're all multiple choice. Thank you. I, I promise. I promise they're easy. I, there's nothing that's hard Monday. like in the last one. Monday? Yes. I think it's due Monday, that, like this coming Monday. No. Yeah. No, no. I gave us two weeks. No. Okay, so I'll have Canvas, to. Canvas, I'm checking it right now. It says Monday. Oh, my God. Okay, so I, I'll change that right away. Thing is, I have to change it in Sapling and Canvas. So if it doesn't get updated quickly, then, then, uh, uh, anyway, so I will, I will fix that. Okie dokie, guys. Hey, Dr. Right. Taro. Thank, thank you, you Dr. very T. much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Uh, yes. So for like, I know the lab isn't due for a while, but are you going to post the stuff on Canvas or is it already there? Like you have uh, our data that? on the computers, right? I didn't post it. I think I posted all of it, but if I didn't, oh, wait. Okay. then um, if I it? didn't, it you under, can like module you... or files. Uh, okay, I can I can find a share here. Uh, uh, oh wait i found it actually never mind <laughs> oh thank goodness thank goodness yep, thank you because i'm having trouble i can't i i can't even share my screen here oh there we go okay Good. All righty, guys. Um, I will update the due dates on things. And um, uh, if you if you turn in uh, your labs to me earlier, I will critique them so that you can have a little bit of uh, time to work on them. Okie doke. Okie dokie, artichoke, Dr. Taro. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Oh, shit. Dr. Taro? Yes, fuck. Is it possible? How are you? I'm good. How are you, sir? Is it good? How are you? Is it possible for me if I leave a little bit early for tomorrow for lab? But I'll get the I'll, sure. I'll make sure to do everything. I'll All make right. sure to do All everything right. before I go. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I understand. I understand. I understand. No problem, sir. And Dr. T, do you happen to know if the master program is open right now for applications? Uh, so, so. Might be, it might be. I'm not sure. It might be open, it might be open. Yeah, you have to check. I check, um, but I don't know if it's open. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. You can check with the chair or the graduate advisor, Dr. Cherizel. Alrighty. Yes. Thank you, Dr. C. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>